Thanks. Um, good afternoon. Um, Pete, I think that uh, your question was a good one because hopefully I can address some of the issues around dealing with traditional authorities, land reform sites, that type of thing. So I'm going to talk today about the, the wildlife economy um, and how the wildlife economy can be used both for things like protected area expansion but also for sustainable finance of protected areas and how it can also meet some of the critical um, delivery goals that government has in terms of land reform, poverty alleviation, economic development, climate change adaptation, food security, all of those types of issues that can be addressed as part of this. So just to start off with the, the biodiversity conservation context, we've already heard quite a lot about um, how state conservation agencies have dwindling budgets, but we've got a, an issue in South Africa that's very particular to South Africa in that it's projected that up to one third of South Africa's protected areas will be under co-management in coming years. So what that means is that there will be successful land claims on existing state protected areas and those land claimants will become the owners of that land. And it's critical that we find ways to make sure that those land owners are benefiting from the land that they own, because ultimately if they don't, we're going to lose those protected areas. Um, and part of that mean, means that we need to embrace collective economic approaches in which the protected areas are integrated into the rural economy. We've also heard a lot about the protected area expansion goals, the, the AHE targets, and we're all well aware of our need to, to achieve those targets and, as was discussed this morning, actually go beyond them. Looking at the, the land reform context in South Africa, so, so land reform has, has really been quite um, conventionally focused on agriculture in South Africa. There's been very little thought about things outside of conventional agriculture. And that's a problem because only 12% of South Africa is arable, and of that 12%, only 22% of that arable land is considered high potential agricultural land, which means that only 2.6% of South Africa's land area is high potential agricultural land. Within that context, 81% of South Africa's total area is used for agriculture, 83% of that is used for grazing, and 17% for cash crops. Um, and what that means is that conventional agriculture is largely a marginal land use. In a lot of the, the areas of South Africa, particularly within the savannah and desert biomes, uh, agriculture is a marginal land use. And it's contributed to issues like land degradation, the, the potential for the impacts of climate change to be exacerbated, um, and diminished ecological resilience in a lot of those areas. So things like the biodiversity economy have the potential to reshape rural development in South Africa. So just to make the distinction, because we do like to confuse ourselves with terminology, we have the biodiversity economy and we have the wildlife economy. <laughs> the biodiversity economy is an overarching term that includes things like bioprospecting and the wildlife economy is one aspect of the biodiversity economy. So South Africa's developed a biodiversity economy strategy and as part of that strategy, they've set a whole lot of goals and targets. The one is that by 2030, the biodiversity economy will achieve an annualized GDP growth rate of 10% per annum. They've then set some really ambitious targets. And when you look at the fact that stewardship has only secured 400,000 hectares of land in the 10, 15 years that it's been around, um, 2 million hectares restored land, that's a, an incredible target, 60,000 jobs created 7 billion rand of equity, 3 billion of which will be in game, 300,000 head of wildlife under ownership of black empowered and owned wildlife ranches. And then just to go a little bit further in the biodiversity economy lab that was held last year, in which people sat down over a six week period in a hotel and came up with the, the, the strategy for this, they prioritized 10 million hectares of land for transformation in the wildlife economy. So, there's some really ambitious goals that have been set in this. Um, just to note that they also um, identified the formalization of the game meat markets and the creation of a network of 110 game meat processing facilities which are black owned. Getting into the, the, the wildlife ranching industry itself, um, there's quite a lot of data that's been generated around the wildlife ranching industry. 
one of the, the issues that's come out is that a typical game ranch generates approximately two and a half to three times the economic output per hectare of conventional livestock farming. Um, in terms of employment potential, the wildlife ranching industry is far more reliant on skilled labour than conventional agriculture. And when you start to think about the role of tourism, obviously somebody like a chef gets paid a lot more than somebody who's a general labourer on a farm. But not only that, the, the minimum wage for agriculture is about 500 grand a month less than the minimum wage for tourism. So what that means is if you're a general labor, laborer in a tourism venture, you automatically are going to earn 500 rand more than, than a general laborer in an agricultural industry. So there, there are a lot of benefits that are coming out related to those types of things. Um, some of the research that's been done shows that there's generally a considerable increase in employment levels when there's a shift to wildlife ranching. And in the Eastern Cape, they found that there was increased employment of three and a half times um, when there was a shift from livestock to wildlife ranching and an, in, an average wage increase of 5.7 times. One of the advantages of um, the wildlife ranching industry or the wildlife industry is that it allows for a combination of multiple activities in one location, so it provides the potential for multiple income streams as opposed to other forms of land use. And those include things like tourism, hunting, live capture and sale of wildlife, uh, venison production. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note is there was a study done a couple of years ago um, by EWT on behalf of Departments of Environmental Affairs that showed that uh, approximately 40% of all wildlife ranching ventures in South Africa are a mixture of both livestock and wildlife. So there is the potential to combine those two activities in, in the same location. To some extent, there is also a mixture of wildlife, livestock and crop production, but that's a far smaller proportion of the wildlife sector. Uh, looking at the tourism market, um, in the face of the financial crisis that the world experienced from 2008, employment levels in tourism in South Africa rose 30% um, from 2005 to 2014. And currently, tourism contributes approximately 3% of our GDP. Interestingly, uh, there's been quite a lot of research done on wildlife watching tourism. Um, and wildlife watching from international tourists to South Africa represents about 80% of the trips to South Africa, or sorry, to Africa. Um, the primary international destinations for wildlife watching tourism are East Africa and Southern Africa. And an average group of six people is the usual group that would come out to South Africa. A tour lasts 10 days with an average daily price per person of 433 US dollars and an, an additional $55 in out-of-pocket um, expenses. So tourism obviously has a lot of potential to play, and in particular wildlife watching tourism has a huge role to play in Southern Africa. Looking at hunting, sorry, some of this uh, is a little bit uh, out of date, and I'm sure Lausanne will co correct me, but it's just to give you a sense of how important the, the, the hunting industry is to South Africa. Um, so South Africa is the largest market share with most visiting hunters and the largest numbers of animals shot and the highest revenue generated in Africa. I think that might have shifted a little bit towards Namibia now with some of the things that Lausanne presented earlier in the week. Um, in 2013, there were approximately 9,000 foreign hunters that visited South Africa. Um, and in 2012, the foreign trophy hunters spent 1.24 billion rand in South Africa, and the overall industry was valued at 6.5 billion rand. At that time, the average hunter's daily fees was more than 3,300 US dollars, and each hunter was spending nearly $8,000 on wildlife and more than $17,000 on the full experience. In terms of the beneficiation of wildlife products, um, there's huge potential in the venison market. Um, and just to note that uh, Conservation Outcomes has just begun a, a project funded by the, the Green Trust um, to look at formalizing the venison market um, with communal biodiversity stewardship sites. Um, so there will be more to come on that, hopefully in the coming year or so. Um, but in 2012, the ABSA Bank did an agricultural outlook um, study in which they showed that the world demand for venison was more than 100,000 tonnes, but the world supply is only 40,000 tonnes. 
They projected that the growth for the, the domestic market in venison was as high as 20% and the export market had the potential to grow by 8% per annum. Interestingly, the current primary source of venison internationally is fallow deer that are farmed in New Zealand. South Africa imports something less than 2,000 tonnes per annum, so there's huge potential for this aspect of the market to be opened up and to, to create new forms of economic development in the country. Interestingly, there are some protected areas and wildlife ranches already that are producing really high quality venison. The main challenges to the venison market are inconsistent and erratic supply um, to the retail sector. Um, veterinary restrictions are a big issue, so in places like the Kruger National Park, which sits behind the red line, the ability to get meat out of those areas and into the domestic and the import market is really constrained. And then there's a lack of coordination within the industry. Just looking a little bit further of the potential of the wildlife economy to really unlock some of the economic development opportunities, there's a lot of opportunities through the venison market to, to take things further in terms of processed meats. There's a big demand for things like tanned skins and hides. And then there's all sorts of opportunities in terms of the decor industry. So looking at um, the appeal of the biodiversity economy, it's ideally placed as a development and transformation sector there's strong and growing international de demand for the products offered, and that particularly applies to things like tourism. Um, it realizes the economic value of indigenous species. It is potentially a completely sustainably, a sustainable industry. It has huge potential to facilitate rural economic development. It has high value added potential, high potential to earn foreign currency, and it may enable the development of new markets and products. Um, looking at how that may be realised, uh, part of the, the biodiversity lab that was conducted last year, I think it was 11 biodiversity economy nodes that were identified around the country. Um, the rationale behind these biodiversity economy nodes is that they can allow for economies of scale, that can allow a variety of wildlife and associated industries. They allow for the development of wildlife-based agri-villages focused on beneficiation of products. So rather than having multiple small abattoirs or processing facilities or factories doing furniture, you can centralise them and, and run them through those types of opportunities. They're intended to enable entrepreneurship aimed at the entire value chain, so the ability to provide logistical support services, transport services, all sorts of services to the tourism and wildlife industry. They allow for the strategic focus of resources in efforts to address the complex challenges of growing rural economies. So the, the, the closest uh, to home example that we have of a biodiversity economy node is the Mfalozi biodiversity economy node, which we have heard about in some of the other talks um, earlier this week. Uh, it extends from Shishlu and Mfalozi Park in, in the east across to uh, a site near Babanango in the west. So just looking at the, the, the Umfalozi Biodiversity Economy node, there's the potential to conserve an area in excess of 150,000 hectares. The dominant land uses that exist there are predominantly compatible with, the, with protected area expansion and the creation of new protected areas and new wildlife um, economy ventures. They re re relate to rural subsistence. There, there is a lot of conservation effort in that area already wildlife enterprises and then Nguni cattle farming, which potentially can be compatible with wildlife ranching. There's also the strong potential for nature-based um, and Zulu culture-based tourism. So there's a, a very rich cultural tourism potential in that area that hasn't really been realised. In terms of progress at the site, um, three communal areas have been incorporated or in the process of being incorporated into Shishlu and Fulozi Park, um, and they are, are have been or are in the process of being proclaimed. The private sector has invested in excess of 100 million rand um, into two or three new lodges that have been established in those areas. Um, and then finally, land has been purchased by KZN Wildlife to consolidate linkages between Emokoseni and Aparti Heritage Park, although there's a lot of controversy around that and that land may be lost. Um, just looking at some of the challenges in establishing the wildlife economy. 
It's important to note that not all wildlife ranching ventures contribute to biodiversity conservation and some are deleterious. So we've already had the discussions in some of the earlier presentations around the impacts of things like intensive and selective breeding. Um, some of those negative aspects that are associated with the wildlife ranching industry and it's really important that we avoid those and try and maintain extensive systems with clear biodiversity outcomes. There's price volatility associated with the breeding and sale of wildlife and we've seen that in, in the presentations that uh, Lazan made. There's limited progress and very few success stories to date in the wildlife economy. There's been limited involvement in the from the private sector. And then within government, there's very little coordination. So there's been issues, for example, between departments of environmental affairs and departments of rural development and land reform. And then in terms of finance, to date, there's been very lim limited dedicated finance for the biodiversity economy. So on the basis of that doom and gloom, I'd just like to end off with a couple of um, examples of where there have been successes. So the first example that I'm going to give here is, is Nambiti Private Game Reserve. This is an area that has been successfully land claimed. A community owns this reserve. It's located near to um, Ladysmith in KwaZulu-Natal. From a biodiversity significance point of view, in terms of the biodiversity stewardship program, it was proclaimed as a nature reserve a couple of years ago. Um, and because of that, it contributes to various biodiversity and protected area targets, both in terms of vegetation and habitat targets. It has things like national freshwater ecosystem priority area wetlands. So it's contributing to a whole lot of targets. And because it was a proclaimed nature reserve, it also became an eligible site for the introduction of black rhino through the Black Rhino Range Expansion Project. In terms of business, um, it, it uh, primarily is a tourism destination with 10 game lodges. Um, because uh, of the studies that were done of the site, it was shown that it was quite heavily overstocked with game and on that basis an abattoir was opened and the reserve began processing game meat. And then it's also made um, money out of live game capture and sale of excess animals from the reserve. Looking at the, 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 the benefits of that, um, it employs 54 people in the operational aspect of the reserve. It's well over 170 people in the tourism aspect, so it's employing over 220 people at skilled or semi-skilled jobs at higher rates than agriculture, and that compares at the time that there were 19 people employed when the initial farms were bought to create this reserve. In terms of finances, it's turning over about 45 to 50 million rand per annum, which is a huge contribution to the regional economy of Ladysmith. In terms of the community benefits, I'm not going to go through this in detail except to note that the community owns one of the lodges and that's the biggest lodge that has in excess of a million rand a month turnover. Each community member gets a payment into their individual bank account every six months, so there's an equitable distribution of benefits. And then, then there's things like preferential employment opportunities. Just some other examples that exist and these are all areas that have been worked with through the, the Biodiversity Stewardship Program. I think a lot of people here are aware of some Kunda Game Reserve and some of the successes that have happened there. Pinda Game Reserve, which is partially owned, about two-thirds of it is owned by two separate communities. A party game reserve, there's the potential to include a whole lot of communal land and grow a party game reserve. And then Babanunga Valley Game Reserve, where there's a lot of in investment interest in setting up an entirely new reserve. Just finally, some of the talking points that I think we need to think about related to the wildlife economy and maybe some of the things that we can discuss in the session after lunch um, are how the wildlife economy has a potential role to play in key environmental and societal issues in terms of biodiversity conservation, protected area expansion, climate change adaptation, sustainable economic development, food security, we need to make sure that these sorts of ventures include equitable distribution of benefits. We need to understand the habitat limitations. So wildlife economy is largely inapplicable in the grass and biome. We need to have questions around the ethics and utilization of wildlife. And then we need to think about unintended consequences like elite capture in these types of things, ethically questionable issues such as selective and intensive breeding, and then issues like human wildlife con conflict. Thanks.